Well, hello everyone, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Matt Kopchak. I'm the Vice President of Operations with Worth Ross Management. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our April Speaker Series event. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, uh, welcome and just wanted to say thank you for joining these each month and participating. Um, this The topic for this month is one that was uh, requested by some of our attendees, so we're excited for this one. Um, like all previous events, uh, the speaker series has been designed to give you an exclusive opportunity to hear from industry leading experts. We hope that you'll gain some valuable insight, learn about best practices, and have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. Uh, before we get much further into this, just a reminder for uh, those that have joined us in the past and then to let those that are new make them aware, we do record each and every one of these and we will make them available on our YouTube channel after uh, the presentation is over, probably later this week. We just want to ensure that all of our board members and our team members have the resources available at their fingertips at all times. So, and with that, we'll lead in today's, into today's topic, which is the Fair Housing Act, the most important items for community associations to be aware of. And presenting tonight, our speaker is Clint Brown. Clint is a shareholder with Roberts, Markel, Weinberg, Butler, Haley. Uh, Clint joined the firm's real estate section in, 20, in 2012 and currently leads Austin's community association division. Clint represents community associations, developers, developer controlled associations, and commercial associations throughout Texas. And his practice areas focus on bankruptcy law, corporate law, and all aspects of community association law. So as I said earlier, today's presentation will focus on the Fair Housing Act, and we are going to learn what the Fair Housing Act is and what are the top five unforeseen risks uh, or the top five pitfalls. <clears throat> so the format for this will be similar to all of our other events. Clint will go through his presentation, and then we will allow time for question and answers at the end. If any questions come up while Clint is presenting, you can chat them to us and we will uh, get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you, Clint. So with that, Clint, go ahead and take it away. Perfect, Matt, thank you, sir. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate y'all having me tonight. Thanks for hopping on and listening to an attorney for the next hour. Sorry, but I'll do the best I can to make this a little exciting. Uh, as Matt mentioned, we're talking Fair Housing Act, which is such an exciting topic. I think the only thing that may be more exciting than fair housing is bankruptcy. So, uh, you know, again, it is a very difficult area to navigate properly due to the int intricacies between federal law and state law. And, you know, the answer you get isn't always a sensical answer, but it is what it is. It's the guidance we've been given and something we've got to follow. So with that, we're going to be doing a pitfall approach to the Fair Housing Act, the top five areas that we as a law firm have seen over the years. We've got a division dedicated to this type of law. Um, so we, we see a lot of it. And, and these are the big hits for community associations in the great state of Texas and, you know, nationally as well. So Number one, familial status, rules and regulations. Number two, disability animals. Ooh, those service animals, those ESAs or emotional support animals and doc requests. Disability group home ideas. What, what is a group home? Do we have to allow them? Uh, HUD's new harassment regulations. When must an association get involved in more of an owner to owner type dispute? And then finally, retaliation, interference, and coercion. It's a pitfall that hopefully we don't see too often, but you as managers and board members need to recognize when it's happening and put a stop to it. So let's start with pitfall number one. So again, fair housing overview, we're gonna get into familial status, the rules and regulations, disabilities, what they are, what happens when somebody makes an accommodation request, versus a modification request. We're gonna get into those assistance animals, group homes, the harassment regulations, and then finally retaliation. So here is our overview. There are two Fair Housing Acts 
that we really have to deal with. Uh, it is the Federal Fair Housing Act and then the Texas version, the Texas Fair Housing Act. The good thing about this is, is that Texas is substantially similar in scope to the federal act. Now, for, for those of you who don't know this, most of you probably do, but whenever there is a conflict between state law and federal law, the federal law will control. So conflicts between the two, federal law tends to take precedent and um, resolution of that conflict is in favor of the federal law. So uh, we're talking FHA. Why aren't, why aren't we talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act? It's because we, both our law firm and, and y'all as a management company, we represent private corporations, corporations that are not open to the public necessarily. So because we are not open to the public, we really don't have a lot of ADA compliance issues we have to worry about, but we do have to worry about fair housing. So that's kind of a distinction to keep in mind. It prohibits discrimination in the sale or rental of a dwelling and community facilities or services. It prohibits steering, so directing people one way or another for some sort of a discriminatory purpose. Prohibits other forms of discrimination and finally prohibits retaliation. That's kind of the purpose of the act. Here are our protected classes. Most of these you're familiar with, some of them are somewhat new, but race, color, religion, sex, familial status. This is a very weird one, but it is very applicable in the community association setting, uh, national origin, and then disability. So those are our protected classes. There are a couple more classes out there that are getting introduced as we speak, um, but right now this is, our, this is our list of classes of persons that are protected under the Fair Housing Act. So what kind of discrimination claims does the Fair Housing Act address? Uh, the first type is the disparate treatment claims. It is intentional discrimination. So the homeowner is treated worse than everybody else because they're in some sort of a protected class. So they're not treated fairly. That's the first time, uh, our, our first type. That one is a little bit more, you know it when you see it type of a claim. The other one is disparate impact claims. This is an unintentional version of discrimination. So the policy or procedure that you've adopted is, uh, appears neutral on its face. But when you dig into it, you find that it actually negative, negatively affects a homeowner in the community because again, they're in a protected class. I'll give a couple examples of the disparate impact type claims that we've seen in the past. And um, you may be scratching your head and maybe you've got to do some rules adjustments after this pitfall discussion. All right, so number one, familial status. What does it mean? It is a child under 18 who is domiciled with a parent or guardian, so a person with legal custody, or a parent's designee with written permission. So you have a person under the age of 18, and then you have a parent or some sort of guardian or designee, bam, familial status has been established. Persons in the process of securing legal custody of a child under 18 also fit within this protected class, and then finally pregnant women um, a fit within the familial status uh, protected class. So that is what familial status means. It's more or less uh, a, a family unit. In effect, discrimination because of familial status is defined as treating families with children worse than an adult only family. Having rules or restrictions that unreasonably limit children. So keep that in mind. It's got to be unreasonable. Making statements that indicate preference or limitations regarding kiddos. So y'all are starting to, you know, the, the wheels are probably starting to spin in your head. Okay, I, I can picture some rules. You're under 18. You have to be accompanied by an adult in the pool. Is, is, that, a, is, is that a rule that's affecting familial status? 
We'll be talking about that. So troublesome rules and restrictions. Oh, well, rules that require parental or adult supervision, rules that set age limits on the use of common areas, your gyms, your, your facilities, your pool, your spa, rules that restrict children from playing, and then finally curfews. Those are all rules that affect familial status. So the next question is, are they reasonable or are they unreasonable? Reasonable rules may be enforced in light of the fact that they may, may affect familial status. Okay, so rule creation. Is there a way we can remove the kind of age, family, child references? Is there any way to do it effectively? Here's some examples. So back in the day, maybe, and I say back in the day, I've seen rules like this in the 2000s, uh, adult swim. So you got to get out of the pool for one hour while the lifeguard is on duty to allow for adult swim. Well, that is treating adult families different than families with persons under the age of 18, right? So that's not okay. So let's not call it adult swim. Let's call it lap swim. Okay, next one. No unaccompanied minors in the pool. That one could be a problem. I'll dig into ways to have age in place if you really want to. Why don't we say, why don't we say competent swimmers only? So here's the problem with saying competent swimmers only though. Who's going to be the enforcer of that? Is there going to be some sort of test to determine whether or not the swimmer is competent? That may be difficult. Well, what, what about age? Is there going to be people walking up to a minor asking them how old they are? So it's, it's kind of a problem either way, but competent swimmers only would get rid of the age limit. Kids cannot play in the streets. And that one just seems reasonable to me, right? It, it makes sense. You don't want little ones getting run over in, in, in the street when somebody's driving through. Children tend to be shorter harder for a driver to see. So how do we fix this? Okay, residents should be mindful of traffic when riding bicycles in the streets. Well, kids don't always ride bikes. So that's one we would really have to think through if, if we wanted to have a good rule in place for our private streets. Again, y'all may not have to deal with that quite as often um, because a, a lot of the associations y'all manage don't really have this type of scenario to worry about. Here is a rule that we have dealt with. I've dealt with this rule. It wasn't 21, it was 18, but I dealt with this rule past six months. Active rule being enforced by an association we had just taken on. Persons under 21 years of age are not allowed use of the clubhouse unless accompanied by an adult. So, Here's the translation for this one. If you're under 21, you've got to be accompanied by somebody that is over 17. Uh, that, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It, it really makes no sense whatsoever. If you're under 18, you've got to be accompanied by somebody over 17. Well, then what about that person that, that's over 17? They fit under the under 21, so you, they've got to be accompanied by another person that is over 17. <laughs> It's a circular argument. It, it's a circular issue. Anyways, silly rule. We, we see this often and it is not a rule you really want to implement. So if you really want to add age, the most common area you see age applied are your pools and your, your gyms. And here's the problem with the under 18, you must be accompanied by an adult. Um, and this is based on case law out of California. The Federal Court of Appeals out of California looked at more than one case, uh, actually a few for one of, one of the two was a condominium. They had an under 18, you must be accompanied by an adult in the pool. And the other one, I believe, was a gym. And the court looked at it and said, okay, what is the reason for the rule? And the response given was, well, you know, they're minors. There's danger associated with a minor being in the pool. They could drown, they could injure themselves. So we want an adult there who's gonna be monitoring these kiddos, these minors. And so the court looked at that, okay, 
facially it's, it's valid, right? So it's that second type of impact. Um, but is, is there a nexus or a reasonable relationship between the purpose of the rule and the rule itself? So the purpose of the rule is safety. The rule itself, if you're under 18, you've got to be accompanied by an adult. Here's the problem with that rule, at least in Texas and, and California. Um, in, in Texas and California, you can be certified by the Red Cross to save lives and lifeguard on a daily basis if you're 17, 16, and to a certain extent, 15. So you are under the age of 18. You can literally be hired and get paid money to save person's lives on a daily basis in the pool. And yet you cannot attend your own pool unless you're accompanied by an adult. So there is no relationship. So the purpose was safety. There is no real relationship to that. So the court found that it discriminated based on familial status. That's the problem with these age type restrictions. Now, if you really want to push forward with an age we're, we're recommending that associations consider kind of an under 14 type rule. So, you know, if you've got age limits on your, on your pool rules or other uh, common area rules, make sure you get with your council to make sure we don't have to worry about that disparate impact issue and discriminating based on familial status. Hey, Clint. Yes, sir. In, in that example, the, with the case law you had mentioned, is that tied? Um to the fact that that clubhouse had a pool. For example, if there was no pool, and let's just say there was a, a, a weight room or just a clubhouse, uh, would that still apply? Yeah. Could that still apply? It would. But, but yeah, potentially, Matt. And, and you've got to dig into the purpose. And again, there's not as much case law on, on other common areas. We've got a lot on pools. But you know, basically, if, if an association wants to consider some age limits, make sure to get with your council. On gyms, if you can get the manufacturer of the equipment to basically, you know, a lot of times they'll give you a quote unquote user's manual. And many times there'll be an age limit in there on what age they think you can use, utilize this equipment. And, and if it's got an age in there, then you can rely on that and say, look, we're not just pulling this rule out of the air. This is what the equipment that we have recommends. So we're following the manufacturer's recommendations. That that puts you in, in a lot better shape. Thank you. Oh, absolutely, Matt. All right, that was number one, pitfall number two. Disability, animals, and docs request. Animals, what are we talking about? Okay, let's start with disability. What is a disability? It is a physical, mental, or, physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more of your major life activities. And there's got to be a record or it's got to be readily apparent. And you have to, the, the issue has to be regarded as kind of being an apparent and impairment. And you've got to be being regarded as having that impairment. That is a disability. So substantially limits one or more of your major life activities day to day. FHA prohibits discrimination in the terms, conditions, privileges of sale or rental of a dwelling and then community facilities or services. So we cannot discriminate on somebody with a disability for our community facilities or services. And then for those of you that have rental programs for rental or sales, if you're involved in that. It requires the association to permit reasonable modifications to the existing premises at the disabled person's expense. So not the association's expense, but at the disabled person's expense, number one. Number two, it requires the association to make reasonable accommodations in rules, policies, practices, and services for disabled persons at the association's expense. Modification, person foots the bill that's making the request. Accommodation, association foots the bill. So keep that in mind. There is an exception, but first and foremost, what's a modification? What's an accommodation? How do we distinguish between the two? Modification is a structural change to existing 
premises. So modify, think about modification, modifying something, you're changing something structurally, that is a reasonable modification. A reasonable accommodation, you are not structurally changing anything. It is actually an exception to an association rule, policy, practice, and or service. So modification, owner foots the bill, and it's a change to something structurally. An accommodation is just changing some sort of a policy, rule, service to meet the, the disabled needs. Here is the exception. Of course, attorneys like their exceptions. A curb cut in connection with a disabled parking space is considered an accommodation. So the association has to foot the bill for the curb cut request. The other area that is a modification, but that we tend to recommend kind of paying for it anyways, is if you've got an owner requesting the, um, the pool access, the disabled person pool access chairs or other types of equipment, Technically, you can shift that over to an owner making the request, but we found that you kind of get what you pay for. So if you're allowing the owner to do it, they get to kind of decide what they're going to do, what kind of equipment they're going to install, who they're going to have install it. So you lose a lot of control over that common element. And, you know, you may not be getting something that's quality. So why not spend a little extra money on it? so that it's available for anybody who has a disability-related need to enter the pool by, by using that equipment. All right, so you don't have to grant any sort of reasonable accommodation that would impose an undue hardship. So what is an undue hardship? Some sort of large monetary or administrative burden or it fundamentally, fundamentally alters the basic purpose of the association. That is how you get to the level of undue hardship where you can deny a reasonable accommodation request. So on reasonable, before we get into animals, on reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications, if you get one of these requests, or it looks like it could be a request from an owner due to a disability, get your association council involved as soon as you can. You do not want to get reported for violating the Fair Housing Act. It gets reported to HUD, Housing and, Ur Housing and Urban Development. They get a caseworker assigned. If they decide to get involved and send you a complaint, you have 10 days to respond to the complaint. So if you get one of those complaints in the mail, you get aware of it, Notify your council ASAP because uh, he or she has a very, very short time frame to provide for a, a response. I mean, 10 days goes by very quickly. All right, animals. There are two types of animals that we deal with. Service animals, which are only two, dogs and horses that provide a service, and there are certain requirements you've got to comply with now, or emotional support animals, ESAs. Those tend to support somebody with a mental disability. So our examples of ESAs, our dogs, our little piggy, our cats, our ferrets, our birds, rabbits, miniature horses, kangaroos, and of course our chickens. Something about those chickens just pecking and bock bocking away really tends to soothe the soul. I don't know why, but people really just enjoy listening to it. <laughs> we see more chicken ESA requests than any other animal uh, in, in terms of complaints. And it just, it's pretty silly, but uh, you know, sometimes you need multiple chickens as well. You really have to have six to, you know, soothe the, the disability. And I, I don't know what it is, but uh, it, it, chickens apparently soothe for ESA purposes. All right, so responding to an accommodation request. First question you ask, does the person have a disability? Second question, does the person have a disability-related need for this accommodation, for this ESA? 
let's assume we're a no dog association, or maybe we're a no dog over 30 pounds association and somebody has a 50 pound dog and they've said they've got a disability and they need this 50 pound dog for their disability. Those are the questions we ask. Okay, so question number one, what if the disability is not apparent? Can we ask for any information? Yes, we can ask for a healthcare provider's note. Okay, so what if the disability is apparent? We see it, it's some sort of physical disability or it's, or it's a mental disability we can readily perceive, but we don't understand the connection between having a 12 foot boa constrictor and the disability. So we need some sort of a nexus. And yes, we can request more information to establish that relationship. So if it's not apparent, you can ask for more information. You can't demand all these medical records, but you can ask for more information, potentially a doctor's note or some sort of professional's note saying there's a disability, number one. And then number two, you can request for more information to establish the relationship between the disability and the ESA. What's the nexus? Engage in it as much as you can. Take the request seriously. If you're unsure what to do, speak with your other management teams. If you're on the board, speak with your manager immediately if they're not aware of it. Uh, interact with your council if you need to get them involved as well. Do not delay. Again, we've got that 10 day clock ticking. If we get a formal complaint, document, document, document. Cross your T's and dot your I's. Make sure you're following all the processes and procedures because if a complaint gets filed, we wanna make sure we've got our ESA ducks in a row. And finally, ask the attorney when you need to ask the attorney. Hey, Glenn, can we ask, can I uh, ask a question since it's appropriate for the context of the, the last slide? Absolutely. Um, so the question is, what at what point could the association violate HIPAA laws? Um, I guess when it comes to asking for proof of the disability. You allow them to submit the proof. A, and, and, you know, they give you a piece of paper with some scribble scrabble on it that doesn't establish any kind of expert recommendation. Well, that's not proof. Look, we need something else. We need something more. Examples include a, a health professional's note or, you know, some, some sort of health experts recommendation. So there is no HIPAA violation when you're requesting that information. Now, if you ask for more information and they send you over their complete medical file, I would delete it and say, look, we don't need that much information. All we need is basically a doctor's note. Uh, so again, ask, it needs to be reasonable. If you want to push more and ask for more information, get your attorney involved. They're going to be able to give you some advice on how far you can go. And I'll tell you this, it's not that far. Okay. And the second part of that question is, uh, I guess it's tied to, if you use the example, like a 30 pound dog limit, the weight limit, what if the owner, this is a hypothetical, but the owner, um, has um, a disability that would warrant the dog, but that it's not apparent. However, the dog exceeds the size limit, the weight limit. So if the, okay, so there is a disability, but there's not an apparent relationship yep. between the dog and the disability. So you can ask for information, again, from a professional that establishes the relationship. This person needs the dog because the dog is able to soothe their PTSD. It came from a, you know, maybe a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, then the weight limit goes out the door. Okay. They, they get to have that animal, number one. And then here's another unique one. Let's assume we've got, let's say we've got a uh, one dog limit for the, for the community. And this person has two dogs, so they're violating the policy. If one of the two dogs is an emotional support animal, it is like that dog never existed. So they, so they meet their one dog limit. It's like it never existed. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, thank you. 
Absolutely. All right. Pitfall number three, group homes. What are they? How do we manage them? Uh, is there anything we can do to restrict them? So here are examples of group homes. We've got group homes for persons with HIV or AIDS, Alzheimer's, hospice, rehabilitation, addiction recovery. So if a person is recovering from some sort of a drug, uh, you know, basically drug overdose, using too much of something, uh, addiction recovery is considered qualified for a group home. Look, and that can lead to some bad situations, but yes, they are covered. Uh, they are allowed in most single family subdivisions. Uh, there's some licensure requirements. You don't see them as much in the condominium regimes and it provides care of the disabled, basically. So yes, they are allowed to be in the community, but it's a commercial business use, not according to the FHA. They're saying any kind of business aspect is outweighed by the public policy ideas in favor of, of this grouping to allow for like-minded disabled persons to get together and recover or just maintain. Again, unrelated individuals, we're single family. We can't have more than one single, you know, one more than one single family in the home. Nope, not a violation per the Fair Housing Act. There are parking, trash, noise, and other nuisance issues. Well, in that instance, you may be able to get compliance. So just because a group home is allowed does not mean you, you can't enforce the restrictions in other areas. So keep that in mind. If you are unsure, again, get with your attorney. They're going to be able to help. Not all group homes are protected under the FHA. Current addicts. So, you know, they're just a bunch of addicts living together doing drugs every day. That is not a group home. That does not qualify for protection under the Fair Housing Act. Criminals, no, that is not a protected uh, or a disabled group that's entitled to group home status. Those with bad, those with bad credit, a bad credit group home. No, that doesn't work. And then uh, sex offenders finally are not disabled. So sex offender group homes also not allowed. And, and there's a lot of guidance on this under the Fair Housing Act. All right, pitfall number four, HUD's new harassment regulations. And by new, I mean 2019. So we saw this in 2019, some new regulations came out and it actually requires the association to do more on uh, certain owner to owner issues. So let's dig right in. It became effective back in 16. We had this, um, this opinion come out in, I believe it was 18 or 19. And basically we've got associations, board members, association employees and management companies that can all be implicated, implicated in this new harassment policy. First type is quid pro quo harassment, an un unwelcome request or demand based on a protected class. And uh, it's basically submitting to the demand or request is a condition to the sale, rental or availability of housing, terms, conditions, pr privileges of a sale or rental, or for providing services uh, or facilities. So unless you do X, I will not give you Y. That is kind of the, the idea of quid pro quo. And if it is because of some sort of a protected class, it is not okay. Hostile environment harassment. This is the one we see much more often. Unwelcome conduct because of a protected class. So again, the protected classes we went over earlier, and it is severe, or pervasive enough to interfere with the use of the home. So sale and rental, we don't see as much, but the use of the person's unit, uh, terms, conditions, or privileges of a sale or rental, or a provision of services or facilities. Basically, it interferes with the person being harassed. It, it interferes with their ability to enjoy their, their unit, their home. And it's gotta be severe or pervasive enough. So what does that mean? You've got to look at a multitude of factors, unfortunately, very factor intensive. What is the nature of the conduct? Is it verbal abuse? Is it physical abuse? Is it some sort of quid pro quo harassment? 
Uh, what's the context, severity, scope, frequency, duration, and location? Is one incident enough? And uh, is it a pattern more than merely a quarrel among neighbors? Is it just more of a tit for tat? Or has it gotten elevated enough where the association has to get involved? Relationships of the people involved, are they married? Are they under the same household? Son, uh, son, father, you know, parent or custodial relationship, all that has to be looked at. <sighs> Harassment is so bad that it causes a person to move away. Frequent sexually suggestive comments and or offensive touching. Frequent use of offensive racial slurs. And then graffiti with kind of a go home or some sort of other ethnic slurs. What's the media that we may likely see this on? Social media, right? Next door, Facebook, other social media sites. Unfortunately, we see a lot of negativity in social media these days, and it's not good. Uh, and if, if there's a relationship between the person being harassed and their status as a protected class, then it may be something the association has to get involved in if the person being harassed reports it to the association and requests the association take action. So again, we've got to look at all these factors to determine whether or not it is one of these hostile environment harassment situations. Unfortunately, it is not easy to assess Prior to this regulation coming out, our law firm and many law firms' general recommendation is, look, that is an owner-to-owner -owner issue. We do not get, need to get involved in that because it just makes it worse most of the time, so that needs to be handled amongst the owners. Now, because of this, we really have to dig in and find out whether or not this harassment is because the, the person being harassed is within a protected class. Individuals, so the person doing the harassing, obviously. Uh, the association, if their employer agent is doing the harassing. Contractors, if there's some sort of a in independent contractor or agency relationship. And then liability for third party harassment. So owner to owner, we can be held liable if we knew or should have known about the harassment. So again, it gets reported to us or maybe it's our Facebook page or our social media page that we are monitoring. We had the power to correct it. How do we try to correct it? By sending demand letters. Is that enough for power? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think arguably it is. And then finally, we failed to take some sort of prompt corrective action. So again, sending our demand letters. Uh, should we file a lawsuit? I don't know that we should go that far, but again, it's case by case. But can we send letters if it's clearly a violation? The answer is yes, we probably should, and we do it under a nuisance type provision. So again, training for association personnel and agents, there's a lot of training on this, how to do it right. Harassment reporting policies, Maybe we want to adopt that if it's if it's bad enough in your community. I don't, I really don't have to draft many of these. Evaluate the authority to respond. What kind of authority do we have? Again, how is our nuisance provision worded in our declaration? Is it strong enough to battle this type of problem? Uh, take stock of our, our website, social media, forum, all that good stuff. And then come up with a good response plan if, if you have somebody reporting it or you knew or should have known about this level of harassment. All right, number five, how are we doing on time? Looking good, okay. And this one's fairly quick. I say that because we don't see this terribly often, but it's important to kind of recognize when, when it could be a problem and get your manager involved, or if you are a manager, get your management team involved and potentially the association's counsel. So cannot inter interfere, coerce, threaten, or intimidate a resident because the resident exercised a right under the Fair Housing Act or helped another person exercise a right under the Fair Housing Act. So we cannot 
do any of that because they're exercising their rights. Adult swim policy complaint, we cannot intimidate a resident because they made that complaint. We cannot charge back the association's attorney's fees because attorney's fees were incurred to respond to an accommodation request. Clint, just charge that guy back. He's a jerk. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to deal with this. Bill him back. He needs to pay. I get it. I, I understand the frustration. Unfortunately, we can't do that. And then responding to a meritless, uh, yeah, this is merit, completely meritless, Clint. There's no nexus. There's no relationship. We want you to bill back the attorney's fees. Um, putting retaliation aside, you know, we have to have some sort of authority to bill back attorney's fees. And, and I, I don't even see a relationship or ability for us to do that outright. But number one, number two, it is retaliation, which is not allowed under the Fair Housing Act. So unfortunately, as I mentioned, Fair Housing Act, Fair Housing Law, not intuitive. Sometimes it makes you scratch your head, but it is what it is. Those darn attorneys drafted the law, made it complicated, right? Just so we can be around and give advice when there are problems. But it, it really is not intuitive. Uh, you know, hopefully this gave you all some guidance on it. it. It sometimes defies common sense. It's nuanced and fact specific. And unfortunately, sometimes it does require unequal treatment. Sometimes you have to treat one person unequally, you know, elevate them up. Uh, versus, you know, being consistent across the board, because generally when we're speaking about enforcing restrictions, we, we talk about being consistent in our enforcement. But sometimes when somebody really does have a disability, they, they get, you know, they get different treatment. And Fair Housing Act, both federal and state, says they're entitled to that uh, special, special treatment or special accommodation or modification. Identify the issues, knowing when to reach out to the attorney. Look, our law firm is kind of a five-minute freebie type law firm. So if you're ever unsure, it doesn't matter if we represent your community or not. Just pick up the phone, call, call one of us. Uh, there's plenty of us around, and we can give you our, our five-minute take on it. Uh, just remember, you know, sometimes you, you get what you pay for but we're always happy to listen and give you thoughts. And then finally, avoid unnecessarily escalating disputes with homeowners. Sometimes a, a board and maybe even a manager has to take a step back from the situation, calm down a little bit and, and just look at it from a hundred foot point of view. And, and, you know, many times you need to make more of a business decision and not let your emotion kind of interfere with what's ultimately right. And with that, we're done. Matt, I will turn it over to you, sir, for any Q&A. All right. So we got we have a handful here. Um, there, it's going to bounce around a little bit, but we'll kind of start with I think, the first pitfall. So is uh, se um, the question is sexual orientation a protected class? Yeah, so that that's one of the ones that are, that's kind of in, in the works okay. for an ADA perspective. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't have a good answer. Right now, I'll give you the attorney answer, maybe. Um, but yeah, no, that that actually is in the works. I was reading an article probably about a month ago about that. Okay. Uh, next one is, so this goes to asking about the disability again. So what about just asking for the information regarding the issuance of an ESA designation without asking for the reason? In other words, if an authority has approved, just take their word for it. So... There's good news on that front. Um, we can actually request a little more information because many times these authorities aren't real authorities, right? You spend five minutes and you get a nice little pretty certificate saying, oh, my dog is ESA certified. No, that, you know, if the disability is not readily apparent and or you cannot establish a relationship between the disability and the disability related need for the ESA, you can ask for more information. And a certificate isn't necessarily enough. Okay. Um, let's see, we have, okay, so 
uh, a unit owner specific uh, sign. Uh, let me start again. Unit owner significantly modifies the unit for ADA accessibility upon sale of the unit to a non ADA buyer. Is remodeling is the remodeling cost to non ADA exclusively between the seller and buyer. Are there any instances where the HOA has any responsibility or jurisdiction, or is that only when common, common elements are involved? For example, trash chute rooms in older buildings are likely not wheelchair accessible. Are they grandfathered in? So there's a couple questions there. Man, and, and yeah, you're, you're pulling in some structural ADA guidance as well, which is a little bit more unique from kind of reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications. Um, <laughs> As to question number one, yeah, you know, it's typically owner to owner, uh, you know, buyer to seller type situation in terms of remodeling it and bringing it back to the state it was in prior to the modification request. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's typically unit owner to unit owner, unless common elements are involved, then the association can require the modification be brought back to the state it was in prior to the request. But again, you know, many times if it's a modification that benefits the community as, as a whole of, over time, it may be a good idea for the association to, to pay for it um, if, if it affects common elements. Okay. Uh, this, is a, this is actually kind of along the same lines in reasonable accommodations. So garage parking, this, is, this is specific example was an older building. I don't know if that plays into this response, your answer at all. Uh, 1964, but are we required to provide ADA spaces close to elevators? Can we accommodate accessible accessibility in valet or visitor parking? That, that sounds suspiciously like a legal question specific to a community. <laughs> it might um, be. You know, I'll give the attorney answer, Matt. Uh, it, it really depends. I've seen instances where Yes, we needed to grant a an accommodation request um, and basically give them, you know, kind of handicap service closer to an, an elevator or other sort of entry point. Um, now, in terms of kind of uh, curbs and all that kind of stuff, if the curbs that were installed is structurally ADA compliant, must you add another curb just because an owner wants or, or another uh, cut curb entry, not necessarily. So, you know, there, there are some, some ways to push back on that, but again, it, it's pretty fact specific. And I, I, I do not want to give you, you know, yep. advice on that particular issue, but yeah, no, it's, there are ways around that. So that, you know, that's, that's the best I can do on, on my. I appreciate answer. it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, on the topic of modification still. So with the modifications an owner is allowed to make for their disability, does that owner then control who can use that modification and can they remove it if they sell? So I okay. Guess, go, yeah, go ahead. So I'm thinking uh, they may be talking about a modification to maybe the common elements. Um, yeah. Do they maybe, get to control it. Maybe we can use a pool chair as an example here. Yeah, I mean, technically, it's it's their modification. They paid for it. If they paid for it, they have control over it, right? So if they want to lock it out to other individuals' use, then arguably the answer is yes. Now, the association can ask if they're going to be willing to allow other owners to use it. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, that, that goes back to my original recommendation, right? The association really needs to look at potentially footing the bill if it's going to benefit the community as a whole over time. Okay, let's see here. Uh, if we get a harassment complaint where the two stories conflict, what actions do we need to take beyond documenting and trying to limit interaction between the parties? Would this answer change if one party is a protected class and the other is not? Yeah, so if, if one party is a protected class and there are protected class har harassment, right? There's some sort of relationship you can establish even if the um, stories are somewhat conflicted, you know, the association may have to take action and send a letter to the, to the other individual. Now, again, you know, if you were able to get a third person involved who could kind of at least partially corroborate 
one person's story or the other, that would help you a lot. So if you could get another narrative, that would be helpful. And again, just trying to work with the aggrieved parties. It sounds like they may both be aggrieved uh, to try to reach some sort of resolution may be best. So again, it, you know, it's really tough. And, and I think this question hits the nail on the head with this harassment uh, issue and, and policy and requirement. It is so fact specific. And there are always three versions to a story, version one, version two, and the truth. Uh, and it's, sometimes hard to parse through all that. So do the best you can. And if, if you're really unsure what to do, again, reach out to maybe some of you for your other Worth Ross team members or your counsel. Uh, he, he or she is going to be able to spend not too much time on it. It shouldn't be an expensive endeavor, but he or she could probably dig in a little bit and, and give some thoughts and recommendations on what to do. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, any alternative to exercising our right of first refusal on a unit resale to stop the sale of, uh, to stop the sale to a registered sex offender? Ooh, that that one doesn't sound like a hypothetical either. <laughs> that that question was uh, that question came in advance of your presentation, so yep. And that is a. Uh, you know, right of first refusal to stop a sex offender from coming into the community. What happens if the sex offender is also within a protected class? That, you know, it, it's a very dangerous proposition. You've got to look at how your governing documents are written. Um, I've had some communities want to adopt kind of sex offender policies. And, you know, the issue with, with all of that is, is what happens when a sex offender slips through the cracks. We've accepted this additional duty to basically restrict sex offenders from getting into the community in, in terms of ownership. One slips through the cracks and then something happens. Well, now we've got a rule we're not enforcing. And now we get added to the plaintiff's lawsuit um, in, in terms of liability. So, it, you know, I understand the reasoning why the board wants to look into that. But again, on, on that one, definitely get with your counsel uh, to, to get a legal opinion on what the association should do, because that, that's got some pretty big ramification potential. Okay. Looks like we got two more. Um, unless more come in. So uh, you had mentioned some group homes are excluded from, or they're exempt from FHA, I guess. Is there any other property types that are exempt from FHA regulations? Well, group, group homes are protected. protected. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they are protected. So we cannot basically, um, you know, in, enforce our single family use or non-business use restrictions in those instances. And I think we, we had some examples, AIDS, Alzheimer's, uh, recovering addicts, um, uh, people with bad credit, not protected. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you had mentioned that if there is an FHA violation that the, typically a caseworker is assigned to investigate. Um, kind of worst case scenario for an HOA, what does, what does that look like? Is there penalties assigned? Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of looking for worst case scenario. Yeah, penalties. Uh, I Monetary? Yeah, monetary. I, I, for some reason, $10,000 is, 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 is in my head. I'm, I'm not confident on the penalty levels, but they can get pretty, pretty expensive. Um, if a complaint gets filed, again, notify your general counsel immediately. You've got that 10 day clock ticking very quickly and you've got to notify your insurance carrier as well. They have to be put on notice so that if there is coverage, they can assign counsel to defend the association ASAP. Being open and trying to work with the caseworker as much as possible and reach a resolution is the best way to do it. 
there's this option to kind of engage in more or less a mediation between parties. Always try to engage in that so that you don't have to spend money on this guy and, and y'all can reach a result with, without having to expend those fees and potentially have penalties levied against you. I've had instances where board members have also been forced to, to attend a kind of, you know, Fair Housing Act courses, right? So 15 hours of watching videos and attending classes so that the, the board member or board members, it's usually plural, have to learn how to better address persons uh, with a disability or a, or, or a protected class. So yeah, there's, there's monetary, there's non-monetary as well. So is, are those damages awarded to the, uh, to the person who made the claim or does that go to the FHA? Uh, it, it gets awarded to the, to the aggrieved party many times. Uh, you know, it, it, it really kind of de depends on what kind of a violation we're dealing with. And in some instances, the insurance carrier will pick up the Claim. Yeah, yeah, there there could be insurance coverage. If there is, then you know the carrier will appoint defense counsel to spend money on defending the, the okay. case. Um, looks like we had another one come in. So on that topic, should a should the GM meet with the caseworker? Should a GM ever meet with an FHA caseworker without an attorney present? You know. It's, it's not a situation you want to be in. Everything you tell the caseworker is going to be on the record. Okay. So, uh, you know, unless you are extremely confident in yourself and what you are and are not willing to say and, and kind of understand the process intimately, it's probably a good idea to have counsel present. Okay. And this is the last one as of right now. This goes back to the sex offender topic. Uh, could, the could the court order or, or laws regarding sex offenders help prevent them from being added? For example, if you are a thousand feet from a school. So is the question, could, a, could there be laws that so I, I read the question uh, verbatim, but I, I think what the question is, is could, I think this might tie into that uh, right of refusal question as well. I'm reading into this, but um, could you exercise that, I guess, or help use that for your case to prevent the sale, perhaps? Um, if the property is also within a thousand feet of a school. Oh, gotcha. Okay, okay. Okay, so there, there's some sort of ordinance that um, that would prevent the person from living there because they're a sex offender and they're within 100 feet of a school. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if we have a potential purchaser who is a registered sex offender and that unit is within a distance that's in violation of a code um, or, or ordinance, then yeah, I mean, I, you know, basically you, you tell the realtor, hey, look, here's the law, you know, we're within hundred feet, he can't buy, or you reach out to authorities to, to advise them, you know, if, if he tries to continue with the sale. So, yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's clear cut, there's a law that says you can't do it. This person is trying to do it. Um, then maybe you can prevent it that way. But what if the registered sex offender isn't actually going to reside in there? What if, uh, what if they're just investors, right? They're buying the unit to lease, so again, all things you've really got to think about, very fact specific. So if you're dealing, if whoever's asking those questions, if, if y'all are dealing with that ac actively, get with, uh, get with your management team, get with your, your attorney so that they can get involved. Maybe they are already involved. Perfect. Okay. Well, that puts us right at six o'clock and I have covered all of the questions. So um, I think that's perfect timing. Perfect. Hopping point. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Clint. Well, I, I appreciate your time and um, thank you everyone for attending. Matt, you're very welcome, sir. And uh, thank you all for having me this evening. And, and I hope you all have a good evening. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.